This module provides an overview of site distance considerations at roundabouts, as well as a hands-on demonstration for how to prepare site distance checks in MicroStation. There's a couple different site distances that need to be verified at any roundabout. This includes stopping site distance, approaching the intersection, as well as along the circulatory roadway, and to the various crosswalks around the roundabout as well as intersection site distance where vehicles approaching the entry are able to adequately see conflicting traffic and make appropriate decisions about when to enter. Approach stopping site distance considers the design speed of the roadway upstream of the intersection and evaluates the distance required for a driver traveling in that speed to perceive, react, and then brake to a complete stop. The stopping site distance we're considering is the site distance to both the crosswalk on the approach as well as to the yield line to make sure that drivers are able to adequately see and react to both of those elements of the design and be able to come to a complete stop prior to entry if necessary. Where we have horizontal curvature on the approaches, the sight lines need to be able to be unobstructed through the medians and various elements of the approach reverse curvature to make sure that we can still see again the crosswalk and the yield line on those approaches. The same where we have right turn bypass lanes. In this case, there's an exclusive lane that feeds in as a yield control bypass. We need to be able to make sure that the outside areas of the curb line provide adequate uh, clear sight lines to that yield point and to the crosswalk on the approach. Additionally, we want to make sure that a Appropriate stopping site distance is available for vehicles making right turns that they have an appropriate sight line to see and react to pedestrians on the downstream exit. Around the circulatory roadway, we also need to verify that vehicles following the R4 fastest path around the central island have appropriate stopping site distance across the central island to be able to see and react to vehicles or objects maybe on the road in front of them. In this case, the site triangle distance from the edge of the triangle to the edge of the truck apron would be the width around the entire central portion of the island that would need to be maintained clear with low growth landscaping in order to preserve the sight lines. Anything outside of that area could be higher growth landscaping in order to provide enhanced visibility of the central island and the intersection. The GDOT Roundabout Design Guide Appendix D2, as well as NCHRP Report 672, provide a formula for calculating stopping site distances. In this equation, V is the speed of the vehicle. So on the approach to an intersection, that would be the design speed of the roadway. Around the circulatory roadway, that would be the speed of the vehicle as it navigates around the central island. And for the crosswalk considerations, that would be the speed of the vehicle as it's making a right turn along the fastest path. The table shows the computed distances for a variety of different speeds at a speed of around 15 miles an hour, which would better reflect the speed around the circulatory roadway, you have a computed stopping site distance of only about 77 feet. However, at a higher speed, say 55 miles an hour, reflecting a higher speed roadway approaching an intersection, you would need a stopping site distance closer to 500 feet upstream of the crosswalk or yield line for a vehicle to be able to see and react to those elements of the roundabout. Stopping site distance also needs to be considered related to the vertical profiles approaching the roundabout. In this particular example, a steeper approach grade has been flattened out near the roundabout entry in order to reduce cross slopes through the crosswalk area to meet ADA. In the process, the sight lines to the yield line and to an object near the yield line have actually been blocked where the vertical profile is blocking the driver's line of sight. So that's something that needs to be evaluated and reviewed relative to the vertical profiles and relative to the grading of the overall intersection as the vertical design is being developed. Intersection sight distance is the distance required for a driver approaching the yield line to be able to see and react to conflicting traffic streams.
starting 50 feet back from the yield line, the driver needs to be able to, from this point, identify whether there's any conflicting vehicles present. And so they can make a decision as to whether they need to yield or whether they can proceed into the roundabout if the areas shown here in purple are clear. We consider two different traffic streams when we're evaluating these intersection site distances. One is the distance from our entry back around the circulatory roadway. The other is from the entry and then up the adjacent uh, leg of the roundabout. For this D2 stream, we are considering the speed of the vehicles approaching the intersection and the speed of the entry as well as the speed circulating. So we're actually looking at the average of the speed of the R1 and R2 for this conflicting through movement when we're evaluating this D2 distance. GDOT considers this a maximum site distance case where you would have unconstrained conditions and you're able to accommodate sight lines for this full D2 movement. In some situations, you may have a site constraint like a guardrail or bridge abutment in the corner of the intersection that may limit the practical intersection site distance that can be achieved. For those situations, GDOT has developed a minimum site distance criteria that still looks at a 50 foot back from the yield line starting point for the vehicle, still looks at our same D1 distance around the circulatory roadway for those conflicting vehicles. But when looking to the upstream leg of the intersection, we're only looking 50 feet upstream of the entry on that next adjacent leg. So this creates a slightly smaller site distance triangle consideration, which limits the additional space that's needed in the corner of the intersection here. So this would be your minimum site distance criteria. GDOT's preference is that the actual site distance falls somewhere between the minimum and the maximum. And so you would need to calculate both cases of site distance and then also identify what the specific site distance that your project site could provide based upon the constraints in the adjacent properties surrounding the intersection. Appendix D2 provides formulas for computing the required intersection site distances. We look at the two different traffic streams and compute the distance based on the speed of those conflicting vehicles. For the first distance, D1, we're considering the conflicting through movement from the adjacent cross street. We're looking at the average of the R1 entry speed and R2 circulating speed for that through movement. The other path we're looking at is the distance along the circulatory roadway. For that, we're going to look at the R4 fastest path speed for a vehicle making a left turn past our entry. These formulas result in the computed distances shown in the table. For a 15 mile per hour speed, which would be roughly representative of your circulating speed that you might use for a D2, you would have a computed distance of approximately 110 feet. Double that speed and you get double the computed distance, closer to 220 feet. This helps to reinforce another reason why we might want to have slower speeds and speed management through the intersection to be able to provide for those operations and safety, but also to be able to make sure that vehicles are able to adequately see other vehicles that are conflicting and provide appropriate intersection site distance without requiring big swaths of the corners to be remaining clear. Intersection site distance checks are constructed utilizing the B splines prepared as part of the fastest path checks. So you actually need to uh, complete your fastest path checks prior to proceeding into your intersection site distance checks. The red and green lines representative of D1 and D2 are actually clips of our fastest path B spline that have been trimmed to the length of our site distance lengths calculated from the formulas in the previous slide. For D1, we use the average of the R1 entering speed and R2 circulating speed to come up with the average speed along this path. 
and that was used to compute this distance. So the fastest path for the through movement along the side street was trimmed from the extension of our entry back up the adjacent leg that computed intersection site distance. The green line was trimmed in the same fashion. So we have our left turn fastest path from our opposing entry, and we trimmed it starting at the projection from our subject entry back around to the computed distance. And this is based upon the speed of our R4 left turn. Upstream of our entry, we create a construction line that is three foot offset from our lane line, from our stripe. Our first distance, we're starting back at a point 50 feet from the yield line and three feet off of the lane line. And we're computing our first leg to the end of our D1 to create our intersection site distance triangle. For D2, we're assuming that the vehicle has proceeded forward and is actually sitting at the yield line. At that point, we're coming back eight feet from the yield line to reflect the position of the driver sitting behind the steering wheel and three foot offset from the lane line. And we're going to project out a line to the end of our D2 curve that we created. And that's going to create our intersection site distance across the central island. Note that if we had done the measurement from that 50 foot point back, we would actually have a smaller, less conservative triangle across the central island. So pulling this forward and measuring from this point eight feet back actually creates the most conservative site triangle to make sure that we're covering both areas adequately. Intersection and stopping site distance checks are performed for each individual approach. Once those are all complete, they can be overlain on top of each other to create this type of overlay graphic shown on the slide. This clearly identifies all of the areas that would be required to have either clear lines of sight or low growth landscaping only to preserve those sight lines versus areas where higher growth landscaping is possible. In general, we want to try to at least maintain those minimum sight lines, but avoid excess sight distance that can allow for higher speeds um, and impact operational and safety performance of the intersection. These areas, particularly within the central island, um, can be mounded up and landscaped to block some of the forward visibility through the intersection and direct the attention of the driver at the entry into the appropriate places where we want them to focus on the conflicting traffic streams. At this point, we're going to transition into some hands-on demonstrations to show you step-by-step -step how, to, how to construct some of these stopping site distance and intersection site distance checks. For developing stopping site distance triangles, we're going to be considering a vehicle approaching the intersection and making sure that they have visibility of pedestrians in the crosswalk as well as any objects in the roadway through the yield line area. We'll be basing that site triangle on the design speed of the approaching roadway. In this particular exercise, we're gonna be assuming a posted speed of 45 miles an hour and a corresponding design speed of 50 miles an hour. So our first step is going to be calculating what the distance is for our stopping site distance. For that, we're going to be ut utilizing some equations that are in the GDOT roundabout design guide appendix D2, as well as in NCHRP report 672. The equations need as an input our design speed values, so in this case, 50 miles an hour. They utilize some uh, assumed values for perception brake reaction time, as well as deceleration in order to compute the required stopping site distance. In this case, we have a 426 foot stopping site distance that's required. So if we first look to the crosswalk, since that's the first uh, feature that the approaching driver will interact with, we can measure that 426 foot stopping site distance using a circle with a radius of that dimension. We're going to look 
at the extension of the crosswalk lane line where it intersects the curb and we're going to center our circle at that point and that creates our distance from the crosswalk 426 feet the next thing we need to define is the position of the vehicle within the lanes we're going to assume that the vehicle is going to be in the outside lane that's going to give us the most conservative sight line along the outside curb line so if we assume the vehicle is in the inside curb line they would require um, less of a clip along the outside curb for sight distance purposes we're going to assume that a vehicle in that outside lane is going to be roughly centered within the lane these are 12 foot lanes so we're going to offset six feet from the lane line if you had a narrower lane you would use a different distance that was reflecting roughly half the width of the lane so this point now reflects the starting position we're going to place a line at that start position and then we're going to extend that over to the projection of the near lane line of the crosswalk where it intersects with the curb face and that is that red line is now our intersection sight line to the crosswalk so we would need to see across the lane lines here and then as we get to this entry curve we would need to be able to see across this portion of the landscape area between the crosswalk and the back of curb and so this would need to be kept as low growth landscaping or sod in order to make sure that the sight line to the crosswalk is preserved next we're going to look at the sight line to the yield line and for that we're going to look at the midpoint of the entry at the point where it intersects the yield line here we have a 30 foot overall entry width and so we're going to offset this 15 feet we'll offset the outside lane line 15 feet to the center of the lane if you had a different lane dimension you would be offsetting a different dimension to make sure that you're finding the center of the lane at that intersection point we're going to use the same circle with the same 426 foot radius we're going to center the circle on that midpoint of the yield line and that created a new construction line for us we're going to still assume that the position of the vehicle is going to be in the middle of the outside lane and we'll create a second sight distance triangle using the midpoint of the lane with our new circle as the starting point and then we're going to snap that to the center of our yield line so once we have those we can delete some of our construction lines And now we have our two stopping site distance triangles identified on the approach. And so you can see that the one going to the yield line would require a little bit more area, but that's primarily just crossing over the sidewalk, which would be expected to be clear anyway. But that area there would be defined as the area that we need to be clear outside of the existing roadway. The next stopping site distance check we want to make is for a vehicle making a right turn that they have visibility of the pedestrian at the downstream crosswalk. For this, we're going to use our fastest path spline curve that we developed uh, when making fastest path checks and utilize that B spline to represent the path that a vehicle would be taking as they take that fastest line around the corner. We're going to use our near side striping of the crosswalk as our starting point that's we want to make sure that we're able to see to that edge of the crosswalk and then we're going to measure upstream based upon the speed of the vehicle to figure out where the starting position of the vehicle needs to be for our side triangle for this fastest path right turn movement we had previously identified a 23 mile per hour speed for vehicles traveling around the corner making that right turn so we'll use that 23 miles per hour to calculate our stopping site distance going back to our equations in our quick spreadsheet calculator here we're inputting 23 miles per hour 
and coming up with 136 feet for our stopping site distance. And again, these are based upon the equations that are in Appendix D2 of the GDOT Roundabout Design Guide. Using our 136 foot distance, we can use our point at distance along tool, enter our 136 feet, and then we'll select the end of our line and that will place an X. We used a character X as part of our construction here. And that'll place an X at the point along the path representing our 136 feet from the crosswalk. We can then trim to that position. We'll place a quick line from that point there that we can trim to and then delete our construction lines and our X. So now that's the end point of our stopping site distance triangle. So we can snap to that point. As the starting point, the end point, we're going to use the extension of the painted lane line where it intersects with the curb line. So it's right at this corner of the ADA ramp. So that develops the edge of our stopping site distance line for vehicles traveling around the corner to be able to see the crosswalk. So the area within the limits of this triangle would need to be kept clear within this landscaped buffer strip and sidewalk area would need to be kept clear so that a vehicle has appropriate sight lines to that crosswalk. The next stopping site distance check is going to be along the circulatory roadway as vehicles navigate around the central island. For this stopping site distance check, we're going to be assuming that vehicles are hugging along the curb line in a position either three foot off the stripe or five feet off of the curb face. In this case, there is no gutter pan, and so we're going to use a five feet off the curb face measurement for this calculation to make sure that, that center of the vehicle is staying that minimum distance of five feet off the curb. If there was a gutter pane, you'd be able to just do a simple three foot offset from the lane line. So we have our uh, position of vehicle, the path of the vehicle as it's traveling around the central island. Now we need to determine the distance. So if a vehicle was starting at the end point here, how far along the path do they need to be able to see in front of them is what we're trying to identify. From our fastest path speed checks, we identified that the fastest path for all left turns around the circuitry roadway from all approaches was 17 miles per hour for this particular location. For other locations with different geometry, that may be a different value. But for this one, we identified 17 miles per hour for our R4 for all of our turning movements around the roundabout. So we're going to use our same calculator with a 17 mile per hour speed for the stopping site distance calculations. Again, these are in Appendix D2 of the GDOT Roundabout Design Guide. We're identifying a 90 foot stopping site distance resulting from that 17 mile per hour fastest path speed. So that's the distance that we need to be able to see in front of us along a circuitry roadway. Using the point at distance along tool, with a distance of 90 feet. We can use that as a start point. It'll create our X along the path. And then we can be able to create a line at our start position to our X position. And so that is the sight line that a driver needs to be able to see downstream, which basically is crossing over the truck apron at all points and would be expected to be a clear sight line um, through this portion of the circulatory roadway. We need to check at a minimum of four points around the central island to establish those sight triangles around the perimeter. For a simple circular central island, you could just take these lines and array them around the center point. For this shape, we have these spirals, and so we'll actually have to manually check multiple points around the perimeter of the central island to be able to verify the um, site triangle and provide an overlay around the central island. So if we check one more point, just for demonstration, we can offset our lane line here, five feet. I'm creating a quick complex chain here just to make sure that I've got enough distance to measure along. And I'm gonna use my 
um, construct active point along distance. And so that sets my 90 foot distance downstream. And then I can do the same sight line to create my sight triangle. And so same as the other point upstream here, we are just crossing over the edge of the truck apron at this point to be able to see 90 feet downstream. So you repeat this process at multiple points around the central island in order to be able to verify the site distance requirements and make sure that if there's any encroachment around the landscape area, that those areas can be flagged for low growth landscaping only. When evaluating intersection site distance, we're considering vehicles approaching the intersection that are heading towards the yield line. Prior to reaching the yield line, the driver needs to be able to look to their left to see if there's any conflicting traffic circulating or coming from the upstream entry. So there's three pieces of information we need to know to construct the site triangle. The first is the position back from the yield line for the starting point of the vehicle as it approaches, the position that it's going to be observing from, then we also need to know the distance around the circle tour roadway and the distance up the upstream leg that we will be viewing to. So let's first look at the position of the driver on the entry and get that established. To do that, we're going to use a offset tool. We're going to be assuming that the vehicle is going to be in the inside lane position. That's going to give us the most conservative distance upstream up this uh, adjacent leg. And then we're going to be assuming that they're hugging the splitter island and kind of following that uh, fastest path criteria where they would be five feet offset of a curb or three foot offset of the lane line. In this case, we have a two foot gutter pan. So we have the same dimension, whether we're offsetting from the curb face or the lane line. So I'm just going to use a three foot offset from the lane line here. And we'll offset this little tangent piece at the end as well. And then we'll extend that reference line to intersect with our yield line. Once we have that, we're going to establish our position back. We're gonna assume that the driver is initially starting 50 feet back from the yield line as they're looking towards this upstream entry. So if we place a circle with a radius of 50 feet, we can intersect that at the yield line. And then we can trim our construction line here to set the end of that line as our 50 foot starting position that the driver is viewing from. When looking across the central island, we want to assume that the driver has pulled forward and is sitting at the yield line. So if the front of the vehicle is at the yield line, a driver is going to be sitting behind the steering wheel a little bit further back. And we're gonna assume that position of the vehicle position of, position of the driver within the vehicle is eight feet back. So we'll set another circle with a radius eight feet. And then we can use our tool here, construct line at active angle from the drop down menu. We can set that at uh, zero and use that to construct a line that we can use as a reference point. So it just gives us our starting position along that line for a vehicle looking around the, around the central island for vehicles conflicting along the circle roadway. The reason we use this position closer to the yield line is it gives us a little bit more of a conservative view. Let's say this is the distance that we need to look around the circle roadway. If we were to instead look from a position 50 feet back, you can see that the sight line that'd be required would kind of clip the edge of the truck apron, whereas a driver that's pulled farther forward actually needs to see across the truck apron. So this closer position is actually slightly more conservative and we wanna make sure that we're capturing that so that a driver that is stopped at the yield line itself has adequate sight lines all the way around the central island. So the next step is going to be looking at the distance that the driver needs to be looking upstream. To do that, we're gonna turn on our B-spline that was developed for our conflicting through movement fastest path. 
the first thing we're going to do is establish the start of the distance. And to do that, we're going to create a line from our intersection here to a point tangent to the central island. And then we're just going to trim off the end of our B spline. So this reference point becomes our starting point for measuring our distance. The next thing we need to know is how far upstream we need to be able to see up this spline curve that's reflecting the driver fastest path. To get that distance, we need to know the speed of vehicles. So we'll be looking at the average of the entry speed, so the R1 speed, and the average of the R2 speed along that curve. I've copied our fastest path speeds that was done as part of a prior step so that we have those handy. For our conflicting through movement, we had an R1 speed of 23 miles an hour and an R2 speed of 20 miles an hour. So the average of the entering and circulating speeds is going to be 21 and a half miles an hour. So the average of 20 and 23. Once we have that information, we can go in to a spreadsheet tool or use the equations straight out of the GDOT roundabout design guide or NTHRP report 672, both have the same equations in them and be able to use our 21.5 mile per hour average speed for that conflicting movement and calculate the distance. In this case, we end up with a intersection site distance of 158 feet that's needed upstream. So going back to our line here, we can be able to utilize the tool point at distance along. We put in 158 feet as our distance. And for what I'm doing, I'm just using a character point type with an X. And if I select at the beginning of my B spline, it's going to place a point at that distance along my path. This character ends up being a fairly large little block, but if I just take a tool and create a point there, I can use that to then trim off the rest of my trim off the rest of my B spline at that point and then delete my construction lines. So I now have a B spline that is 158 feet long that matches my site distance. And at that point, I can snap to my starting position where the vehicle is viewing from, and then snap to my ending position where they need to be able to view to. And that creates my intersection site triangle up this leg. So this is the area that needs to remain clear so that a driver that's at this position approaching the entry has enough visibility to be able to see any conflicting vehicles. Next, we're going to look at the distance along our path around the central island. So we will turn on our spline curve that was related to our uh, left turn path. Once we have that, we can then trim it in a similar fashion. So we'll trim the end point of that. And then we need to identify the distance along. So going back up to our fastest path curves, for that portion of the left turn around, we had 17 miles per hour as our circulating speed. If we go back to our calculations, 17 miles per hour is equivalent to 125 feet. So if we come back down, to our drawing, we use the construct active point along tool at a distance of 125 feet. That gives us our location. We can set our point there. And then we can delete and trim. So now we have our distance along established at 125 feet as well. 
and we can be able to then go in and construct our line from our reference point eight foot back from the yield line to the end of our path. And so this is the portion within the central island across the truck apron that you need to be able to see across. Note that the intersection site triangle for this approach did not get into any of the central island landscape areas, just cutting across the edge of the truck apron. So as long as we're keeping the end of this island clear and across the truck apron clear, which would be expected, then you would have adequate sight lines in all these corners. This would be the the only other area that we need to be kept clear is right on the corner um, southbound. So if there's any landscaping or anything in there on that corner, it need to be sod or low growth landscaping to avoid any obstructions. But that is the basic construction of the site triangles. You can then come in and hatch out these areas within both of these site triangles in order to be able to identify um, those areas that need to be kept clear and used for overlay figures.